Welcome to the Whose Body Is It podcast. I'm your host, Isabella Malvin. For those who don't know me, I'm a birth worker, a life coach, hypnotist, and a former liberal feminist turned radical truth teller. On this podcast, I expose the forces at play attempting to control our minds and bodies, such as transgender ideology, pornography, prostitution, and so much more. Together, we'll untangle patriarchal lies as you listen to jaw-dropping interviews with women from around the world. Warning, while listening to this podcast, you might find yourself triggered or perhaps notice where you've been biting your tongue on the issues that matter most to you. In my coaching and hypnosis, I help women and men stop getting triggered by every single thing, cultivate resilience, stop unwanted behaviors, and increase self-confidence. You can book your first session at whosebodyisit.com, and you can find that link in the episode show notes. And I just want to say that it's because of your endless support that I'm able to interview amazing women, get their stories out, and produce regular episodes for you. So with that being said, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel on YouTube. And if you're listening in, leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And also consider making a financial contribution via the link in my show notes. You can also visit my activist sticker shop. My pro-woman stickers have the power to intercept transhumanist programming. So take a photo of your stickers out in the wild and tag me on Instagram at whose body is it? Without further ado, let's get into this week's story. So you may be aware of the prevalence of pornography, the way it's crept into popular media and normalized the objectification of women and girls. But today's guest, writer and activist Caitlin Roper, is bringing news from the outer limits of male sexual entitlement. In this episode, we explore an emerging threat in the exploitation of women and girls, sex robots and sex abuse dolls. Caitlin notes that lifelike sex abuse dolls, including ones modeled after infants, toddlers, and children, have been available for sale on popular platforms like Etsy, Alibaba, and Amazon. Apologists will say, better these men should do this to a doll than to a real woman or girl. But for Roper, this logic does not hold up to scrutiny. In her new book, Sex Dolls, Robots, and Woman Hating, Caitlin says that sex dolls and sex robots have actually created even more opportunity for exploitation and abuse, including the production of sex abuse dolls made to look like specific children and Instagram influencers. As the campaign's manager of Collective Shout, an organization that combats exploitation of women and girls in media and pop culture, Caitlin discusses her work with teen girls and the skills needed to resist porn culture in everyday life. So my name's Caitlin Roper. I am a I'm an activist. I'm campaigns manager at uh, a grassroots campaigning movement called Collective Shout for a World Free of Sex Exploitation, and that's based in Australia. And we campaign against the objectification of women and the sexualization of girls. Uh, in media, advertising, and popular culture. So I've been in that space for more than a decade. And from there, I guess my interest in, you know, sex dolls and sex robots and some of these related topics, well, I mean, because sex dolls and sex robots are inherently related to pornography and prostitution and the sex trades, all these things. So, yeah, just um, they're very much connected. But my book, Sex Dolls, Robots, and Woman Hating, has just been released uh, just in the last few weeks and it's published by Spinifex Press in Australia. And if you're not familiar with Spinifex Press, they're the leading independent feminist publisher in Australia and probably in the world that I know of, but they publish so many amazing books by wonderful radical feminist authors on on a range of topics, uh, whether it's pornography, uh, the sex trade, uh, fiction, poetry, 
uh, really everything. So they do some really great work. You combat the sexualization of, of women and girls. What, what does that actually look like? You know, you're going into schools. Are you doing online programs? What is, what does that work? Uh, how does that manifest? Our main history and I, I guess our main focus really is campaigns. It's running different campaigns, challenging or exposing companies that that profit from objectifying women or sexualizing girls uh, in their services or in their advertising for their services. Uh, there is also the schools component, the education component. Uh, a couple of my colleagues go into schools and run workshops teaching young people, well, I guess really media literacy and mm. about recognising uh, sort of a porn culture and a toxic porn culture and how they can push back, those kind of things, just just sort of equipping them with with positive messages and about what they can do and that, that they can actually reject that that part of the culture. So there's the, the schools and education component, but we've had more than a decade, we've had about 12 or 13 years now where we've been running campaigns against corporates. We've had some pretty significant victories over the years. We've um, gotten rid of sexist and sexualized advertising. We've gotten rid of um, pornographic magazines that sexualize teen girls and promote sexual harassment. Mm. We've got rid of child sex abuse dolls from a uh, major online platform, Alibaba. We've really done mm. a lot of stuff wow. over the years. Yeah. So it's yeah, challenging uh, porn and porn culture, the sex trade, and sort of the everyday objectification and sexualization of women and girls. I mean, there's a lot of propaganda to combat so the fact that you've had victories is is really significant I mean that that's major I mean I don't know what what it's I've never been to Australia I don't know what it's like but I imagine it's uh quite similar to 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 what it's like here I mean what are the responses I mean I've taught teens I've gone into high schools and and taught um reproductive health workshops but that got that got sliced uh, because of some of the content that I was sharing was was uh, too politicized. But um, but what what is the response? I mean, how do typically? I mean, what would you say? How do teens respond? Are they very uh, you know? I mean, I'm I'm trying to think of an equivalent growing up of like okay, like all my friends are doing drugs. All I want to do is try drugs, and then there's one class by one guy who comes in and talks about his like drug horror story and how drugs like ruined his life. You know, like so what? I, I'm wondering like if uh, what the attitude or it must it must vary, but I'm trying to imagine like what is it like as a teen. Uh, to be, you know, on social media constantly and not even know the distinction, you know, b- between pornified and just posing, you know, in, in clothes, mm-hmm. like not understanding that, you know, have your tongue, having your tongue, you know, wave out of your mouth is like porn informed. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering what uh, how teens typically respond to the the more kind of interactive workshops and classes that 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 y'all do. I think overwhelmingly this, the responses are very positive. The The feedback is that they're not getting this message from anywhere else and it, it's sort of giving them permission to to call this stuff out and to say, I don't actually have to accept this, especially uh, the, the young women and girls because mm. when we talk about or we, we hear from them, we hear from them about their experiences uh, of what it's like to grow up in a, a porn culture and their experiences of sexual harassment, you know, daily sexual harassment, requests for nudes, being moaned at, you know, sexually moaning in the classroom and, you know, a range of, you know, a spectrum of sexual harassment through to sexual abuse and even and rape. And so they they already know there's a problem. They, they're already struggling and suffering. So really I think when my colleagues go into schools, they are actually empowering these young women in the real the true sense of the word empowerment they are actually giving them power and knowledge and the ability to sort of identify what's going on to say that it's not okay to be able to speak about it and and to say no so a lot of these girls are saying you know I didn't know I could say no or you know I what do I I don't want to hurt his feelings or or, or things Mm. like that so that we're really just giving them giving them information and power so that they can actually respond to what's happening and to to expose what's going on and to to try and stop it as best they can but to act where they are and and knowing that they can act and they don't just have to accept that this is just how it is 
I, I love the term you used, uh, media literacy. Mm -hmm. So, so important. I remember doing like, I had internet class where we were supposed to be uh, discerning around source sources, but, you know, yeah, the, but the media literacy from uh, a feminist lens or from like a pro-humanity <laughs> lens, it sounds like what, uh, what, what you're doing. So then how do you start, how did you start researching sex dolls and, and sex robots? So a few years ago, well, it's pr probably a bit of a longer story, really. There's just, it wasn't just one thing. There were a few different campaigns about sex dolls and child sex abuse dolls. There was, I guess, just an awareness, particularly of child sex abuse dolls over the years, just seeing different companies and what they're putting out and being involved with a few different groups campaigning in this space. But I think a few years back, I came across an article that was talking about you know, claims from this sex robot designer who claimed that he created a sex robot that came with different uh, pre-programmed personalities and that one of these personalities was named Frigid Farah and essentially was uh, made to facilitate men's rape fantasies because it was like the idea was the robot didn't want to be touched, didn't want to have sex. So obviously it's geared towards a very specific kind of man or a very specific kind of fantasy mm -hmm. and I remember thinking well I thought that was obviously gross they're all pretty gross but what really surprised me was because this was in a Facebook post that I saw it the comments underneath the post were basically saying that's so disgusting that's promoting violence against women that's really bad but then the common thread was most of these comments concluded with but it's better that men use a doll or robot than a real woman and I remember thinking I don't think it works like that like I don't think, like, I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was, but I just thought I that doesn't sound right to me, this idea that, well, first of all, you're not challenging this entitlement that men have to women's bodies. You're Rather than saying, hey, maybe you can't just have what you want when you want and you can't just use women sexually and you're not entitled to sex or to access sexual access to a woman's body. So there's no challenge there. It's just kind of this acceptance, well, men will just... You know, men want what they want. They need sex. Otherwise, they'll rape. And no real thinking about that or the, in, even imagining there could be another way. So just this idea that men are going to rape anyway, they need sex, therefore some sort of sexual outlet must be provided for them. And I just thought, mm, yeah, that I, I'm not buying that. And, I mean, the fact that that's the same justification that's been used, you know, for the sex trade to justify the sexual exploitation of women and girls in the sex industry because men might otherwise rape or become violent towards other more worthy worthy women and so yeah I just got it got me thinking from there and I started to do a little bit more research I started having a look around in some of the online forums where men who own sex dolls talked about their dolls and I was really quite taken aback with some of the things that I found because some of them related to their dolls as though they were actual partners and they would say things that were frankly delusional and I don't know if they were aware they were delusional or if they kind of knew but they were just sort of playing into the fantasy like talking about all the things that they would do with their girl and you know like while oh, we play video games together or she's doing this and where all the activities and things they would do and and basically, uh, a lot of them as well found or described the dolls as superior to women. Mm. And so it just got me thinking, like, okay, so why is that? What are they looking for in a woman? What is it that's so appealing about a lifeless doll that is constantly sexually available and never says no, that has no needs, no autonomy, no any of these things? So, yeah, I just I became really interested in the topic. I started to do more research. And then just the more that I learned, the more I thought people need to know this because I think so many people do think, oh, you know, sex dolls or robots, maybe that's a little bit weird but or, or it's not for me. But, you know, whatever floats your boat, or, you know, the, those kind of things like, oh, what a weird and wonderful world we live in. And people just, you know, acknowledging that's a little bit different or maybe not for them but not recognising that these products are harmful, not recognising the inherent misogyny of these products, that these 
it's overwhelmingly a male market. This is an industry for men. It's and the products being produced, they're female bodied, like primarily female bodied. There are some male body dolls out there still marketed to men. Mm. But that this is a gendered industry in the way that the sex trade is a gendered industry. It's dolls and robotic dolls made in the likeness of women and girls marketed for men's sexual use. So I thought I think people need to make that connection. We're talking about rape culture. We're talking about violence against women and all of these things and the need for consent and the Me Too movement. But then there's not, I thought there's not this connection where people are seeing this industry and putting the pieces together. They're not, um, they're just not making that connection. So I thought someone needs to write this all down, say all the things that I found and just put it right there in a book for people to be able to read. Mm. It reminds me of when we won't go so far down this rabbit hole, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like the, the transhumanist kind of a agenda of, you know, like not needing our fleshy bodies really anymore and having these replacement parts. And that includes not just our own bodies, but having these, uh, you know, silicone, um, yeah, replacement parts. And like, you know, I think uh, the, the, we've been primed for this or men have been primed or, and I think also women have maybe been primed to think that this isn't so bad because of our relationship with mechanized, you know, tools and sex toys, you know, for erotic, you know, pleasure. And again, it's not a one-to-one you're talking about a sex doll in the like of, of a woman or a girl. And I'm, you know, bringing up the, maybe some kind of tangential co- connection to mechanical, you know, sex toys, but uh, I've I've seen I've seen videos of these men talking about their dolls, and I I find it interesting. They always use the word girl, right? It's never like my wife or my my woman or my part my life partner. It's always like my my girl. Yeah, I mean, it it, it totally it reminds me also of just like the uh, um, the the necrophilia in our culture, like uh, because men are are primed through porn. Uh, to see women as, as you said, having, having no agency, then I find that, you know, I mean, this creates a lot of issues, but like in relationship dynamic, the more we are also isolated, right? The more time we spend alone, the more creative we become in getting our needs met. And so that eliminates the practice and the, that relational uh, practice and dynamic of of being of being human, like uh, in a relationship and a sexual dynamic. I wonder if the uh, the market has <laughs> increased in the past, you know, two and a half years with the you know the isolation, the 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 sex stall and sex robot manufacturing industry. How has it grown? Would you say you know let's just say like the past two three years? Well, I think I mean it is a growing industry for sure. I think particularly uh, around COVID, there were definitely men who, you know, made sure to buy a doll at this time. I recall even one of the men on one of the forums bought his doll and he named it Corona because he got it, oh, you wow. know, beginning yeah. of coronavirus. But then Matt McMullen, who's the founder owner of Real Doll, which is one of the major um, sex doll companies, manufacturers in the US, he, uh, he said that he had actually anticipated a lot more people would be buying or men would be buying sex dolls over the COVID period, but that it hadn't been as much as he thought because, you know, I guess a lot of people are finding themselves in a financially insecure place. Mm. So they're not necessarily in a position to be spending thousands and thousands of dollars on, you know, a sexual product. So I will say it's definitely a growing industry and particularly as the technology advances and there's you know, new features and different things like that. And yeah, there's men who have multiple dolls. They, they have like harems, <laughs> they, they have, they want to have many dolls. So yeah, I don't think this is going away anytime soon. I think it is going to be, uh, you know, a bigger part of, of our culture and, and our lives. Is there any place in the world where this is illegal? In South Korea, they, they their laws are a little bit complicated. So They did initially say, I think they could have the adult sized ones, but not the parts, or maybe I've gotten that backwards, but they have, I mean, a lot of countries have banned, well, not a lot of countries, some countries have banned the childlike dolls, the child sex abuse dolls. But I think most countries or most governments, 
they don't necessarily make the same connections with the adult size dolls. Like I think most people, when we're talking about child sex abuse dolls, you know, replica girls for men's sexual use, they'll recognize that's inherently not okay, that that's really horrific and that there's a connection between sex dolls modeled on the bodies of children and, and harm to children. Like there's, there's impacts like for the real world consequences for children but then that doesn't seem to translate when it comes to dolls model on the bodies of women. So people can recognise that the child dolls are harmful, but when it comes to women, they say, oh, well, you know, whatever, that's whatever people want to do, and they don't make the same kind of connection. But, you know, if we if we understand that these dolls modelled on children, marketed as being endlessly available for men's sexual use, will have implications for kids, then why can't we see that replica women made for men's unlimited sexual use, that men can do whatever they want to, whenever they want, and practice all kinds of sexual things on this doll that perhaps a woman couldn't withstand. How come we can't see that that is also something we need to be talking about? We're not making the connections between rape culture. We're not talking about consent. We're not talking about men's violence against women. We're just sort of saying, oh, well, the child ones are bad, but adult ones, mm throwing up our hands so we really need to be making these connections and you know recognizing how this objectification and dehumanization of women at an industrial level mm. how is this going to harm women how it's already harming women you know in your book in your work um do you call for uh you know the manufacturers being prosecuted yeah what is what is the kind of like the call to action to to end the production of of use or to is it to penalize the buyers like in the you know when we talk about the sex trade like what yeah what is the kind of the um the call to action that's a really good question and i think that's actually worth like some strategizing at a at a wider level but what i did do in the book was well, I, I talked about some of the strategies that we've actually employed at Collective Shout and other sort of campaigning groups that have been quite effective. One of these is, you know, getting legislation to criminalise dolls. So in Australia, for example, child sex abuse dolls are illegal. You can't possess one, you can't send or import or advertise them. And the penalties for individuals found with child sex abuse dolls or breaking any of these related laws are pretty serious. Like you're facing jail time and some really significant fines. So that's one way is to actually lobby the government for, for laws against these products. And I've spent a bit of time, you know, throughout the course of my research for the book, monitoring different pedophile websites and looking at their conversations about different laws, where they are and how that impacts them. And while some of them go to this one extreme where they talk about how can we get around the laws, how can we, you know, find ways to, to trick the authorities or to be to kind of slip by undetected, then you have, on the other hand, some of them saying, you know, well, I live in Australia and it's just the laws are too, they're too strict, so they won't even try. So we do know that really good, strong laws will deter these men from trying to import the dolls. So that's one aspect that I do talk about in the book, about the need for legislation and not just against child sex abuse dolls, but we, again, like I said, we need to be talking about dolls modelled on adult women. But the other thing that I found to be quite effective, particularly in the course of um, campaigning with Collective Shout, is to go after the platforms that are hosting these products. So, for example, it might be a little bit hard to believe, but we found child sex abuse dolls, including dolls modelled on the bodies of little girls, toddlers and even babies on major online platforms. So I'm talking about Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Alibaba, th things like this. So, like, you know, all of these companies, it seems, have not had the best systems for, for dealing with these products on their website. But So we've run campaigns against these different websites and we've basically gone to them and said, look, here's here are your statements on corporate social responsibility. Here's what you claim to be doing. Here's what you say your values are. How does that stack up against selling child sex abuse dolls modeled on the bodies of toddlers or men's sexual use? And of course, it you know it doesn't work. So when you expose this stuff, what we do, what we did, which which is um we shared photos of these products and quotes from how they're marketed you know, on Twitter, on social media, mm -hmm. and you expose these companies 
And that's where we've had the best results because then they, they kind of go, oh, we don't want to be a part of this. We don't want to be associated with this. So we're going to get rid of these products. We're going to ban these sellers or do whatever they have to do. But that means a whole lot of men who would otherwise be buying these products, you know, if these companies, these major online corporations get rid of those products, then that's just one major obstacle for these men buying them. And it's, again, for the companies who aren't going to be able to profit, they're not going to be able to sell their products. So we found that to be quite an effective way of um, mm-hmm. responding to the issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure there are so many legal loopholes, like it's hard to prove, okay, you buy it. <laughs> okay. But what's, where's the proof that you're using it? So, you know, is, is the, is the, you know, legally, are you going after just the manufacturing of them? Because, you know, like if you think about, there's lots of uh, uh, silicone uh, uh, models and, you know, for movies or for artistic purposes or for sets, you know, all sorts of purposes. So I imagine it's also would be really hard to criminalize. Okay, you bought it, but how can we prove that you're using it? Like maybe it's for an art project. Maybe you're a painter and you're like setting up a, a set or something like it. Like, obviously, we know that's like bullshit. But I imagine like in the eyes of the law, it would be it would be difficult to actually prove its its use. Well, for example, the Australian laws, which are specifically against child sex abuse dolls, they basically say if it's a sex doll, so if it has orifices, penetrable orifices to be used for sex, and if it appears to be in the likeness of a child, if a reasonable person would think that's childlike. And they say even if it has some adult features as well, that doesn't matter, it's still against the law. So, for example, if it comes with a full face of makeup, they're like, well, it's still childlike. Even if it's childlike and has big fake breasts, they say, well, no, it's still childlike. Because a lot of these manufacturers actually use different tactics to try and get around the law. So some will Mm. put large fake removable breasts on the dolls to say, oh, see, it's not childlike. Or they'll do things like they'll suggest people don't actually get a doll with orifices and like make their own later and they'll provide a tutorial and teach them how. (gasps) So they really sneak all these different ways, yeah, how they can try and get around things. But also in Australia, when it comes to the child sex abuse doll laws, uh, it has to be found that the person, the buyer, deliberately ordered a childlike doll. So there was a case, I believe it was last year, where a man was charged with ordering a childlike doll and he just said, oh, I just ordered a doll. I didn't know it was going to be child size. Like that was, you know, that I didn't intend to buy a childlike doll, even though his Google searches revealed he was looking for a teen sex doll. So that that's the question when if they can prove that they intended to buy a childlike doll because that's the difference do you know about the 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 laws here in the u.s or in in canada are they are they i'm are not they sure about canada in the u.s there's only a few states that, that have criminalized child sex abuse dolls mm-hmm. some countries don't have specific laws they just sort of under existing obscenity laws say that's that's obscene and we're gonna, not going to let it in like but yeah, there are campaigns, mm-hmm. you know, in different states in the US to criminalize these dolls. And even there was some federal, potential federal legislation in the works, but it was stalled and I think it's disappeared. So yeah, we'll see. Um, as more information comes out about these dolls, and I think as more people get an understanding of the issue and and even the connection between the dolls and sexual offending against children, I think more countries will want to be getting on top of this issue mm-hmm. and do you talk about that in your book the like debunking the myth that men's access to these dolls doesn't decrease uh pedophilia and rape oh yeah yeah for sure i spend a good chunk of space on that i have two chapters in the book uh devoted to child sex abuse dolls and in one of them yeah i go through all of these these myths and respond to all these arguments from defenders of child sex abuse mm-hmm. dolls who claim you know, oh, it's just a sex toy like any other. Oh, it's it could prevent child abuse and, and all these things that they say with no evidence. Uh, and what I also have done in the book is I go through and I outline a whole bunch of cases uh, that I've been uh, documenting over the last year or two of men who are found with child sex abuse dolls and are also found to be sexually offending against children as well. Okay. So I'm saying, okay, can you see that yeah. just because these men have dolls, It hasn't stopped them offending against children. Sometimes they're doing both or they're typically almost always found in possession of child sexual abuse material. So they're found with images or footage of 
Mm. the rape, abuse and torture of children and babies. So this idea that this is somehow protecting children, I mean, first of all, it's not. But second, some of these men are also incorporating actual children into their sex doll use. So I've included a couple of cases in the book where men have done this. So one man, he had five sex dolls and police, um, you know, when the police came and found these dolls, they found that one of them had the face of an actual child, like the photo of an actual child stuck to its face. So he, even in that way where he's not directly contact offending against a specific child, he's still using that child. That child is still involved in his sex doll use. And there was another case where it was actually a teacher in Australia and he'd done much the same thing. He'd made masks for his child sex abuse dolls based on school photos of oh. the kids at his school. Oh my so God. you see this is still harmful to these kids. It's still exploiting these kids. And then the next thing is that there's a number of child sex abuse doll manufacturers who offer to customise dolls in the likeness of actual children. So they say, send us a photo and we'll make the doll. So, you know, I've seen, you know, things where pedophiles will request a doll made, you know, in the image of a certain child and I'll just send a photo. So this is a new way that kids are being put at risk because this means that you could have like you, know, you could have a pedophile who has children in his care or children known to him or even children not known to him where he's just found photos on Facebook or something like that and they are set to public and he can access them. And this could, you know, a child sex abuse store could be made based on those children. So even where pedophiles and their defenders are saying, you know, they could this could protect children. I'm just like, do this the whole new way that children can be exploited, even without their knowledge, without their participation, without anything. Like they can be, you know, they don't actually have to have any real engagement. There was a collector shout. We ran a campaign. We're still running a campaign against Etsy, who refuses to actually rid their platform of these products. And we found a couple of years ago when we started the campaign, one Etsy seller told us that a doll. Uh, a childlike doll they were selling was modelled on a 14-year-old Instagram influencer. And I won't share the name just, you know, for that girl's privacy. But so this is already happening. And then because uh, we posed as buyers, so we sent in photos of computer-generated mm. images of non-existing girls, just pictures of their faces, but girls that didn't exist. And we said, oh, could you make dolls to look like these ones? And the seller agreed. So it's already happening where buyers are saying, oh, I want the doll to look like this. I mean, most dolls already have customizable sort of features. You can choose the skin tone and the hair color and the eye color and all these details. But yeah, it's it's gone even further now with some of these sellers saying, we will make the doll in the image of this specific child. And in the book, I do actually quote one pedophile from a pedophile forum who talked about how his, one of his, he had multiple child sex abuse dolls, but he said one of his girls looked just like a girl in real life that he was obsessed with. And this was a girl in his care. He didn't specify exactly the connection, but he talked about how he would dress his doll in the way that this little girl would dress and the ways he would kind of try to enhance the fantasy that he was sexually abusing this little girl, an actual girl in his life with a doll that was intended to look like her. Wow. I mean, it, it. I mean, it makes so much sense. But like again, so important to to name. And thank you for giving all those examples. Um, because yeah, I mean, I I think a lot of women can relate to like your initial uh, you know, the what you described. Your response was when you when you saw uh, on the internet, you know, a, a guy, you know, or, or comment saying, but uh, at least it's not a you know a real child. Um, I think a lot of women can relate to that discomfort and that that knowing that something is horribly horribly wrong, but can't find the language or do, you know hasn't done the research that you've done, uh, taking the time to really to do such a deep dive in into this. So I'm so glad that that your book is is out there for for women to to learn more and to get educated on this particular um, topic. I mean, I'm curious what it's like for you. You know, on a, on a personal level. You know, uh, I was like, oh, what do you do for work, Caitlin? You know, how do you <laughs> how do you navigate uh, that? What are some of the responses that you get just in everyday life or with your family uh, around the, the work that you do? That's so funny that you asked that because I literally open the book, like the introduction starts <laughs> like about that very thing because people do ask or they say, oh, like, 
I, I hear you're writing a book. What's that about? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I kind of have to weigh up like, oh, is this person going to be able to handle this? Like, can we have this conversation right now? Like, or we're at a wedding or a birthday mm. party or at school pickup or something. And I'm like, is this the time and the place to be honest? <laughs> so it depends. Sometimes I will, you know, I'll gauge the situation and I will sort of say, here's what I do or here's what I'm writing about. And other times I'll just say, I work for a nonprofit <laughs> and oh, avoid okay. the conversation okay. completely. It just, yeah, I kind of try and judge what the situation calls for. But I get I get mixed responses. Sometimes people are, you know, quite taken aback, which you would expect. They're like, oh, wow. Um, others, they're quite interested because, you know, it is a really fascinating topic and people want to discuss it and talk about sort of the ethical implications of it all. Uh, sometimes people make, yeah, jokes that are kind of like, oh, you know, often like men will say something like, oh, let me know if you need someone to help test them out. And I'm just like, <gasps> yeah, things like that. And you're kind of like, <laughs> gross. Yeah, so just comments like that, but it's always, it's always a guy. I did have one woman say to me though, this was also at a wedding. This, I don't know why it comes up at so many weddings, but um, she said, oh, I hear you're writing a book on sex robots or something. And she's like, oh, I run an erotic website myself. And I'm like, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> that's not the, the approach I'm taking here. This is not an erotic novel or anything, but. Mm, erotic we'll website. I mean, what even is that? I mean, it was it uh, like a, yeah. yeah. Huh. Oh, wow. Okay. I imagine, or I would hope that parents are eager to learn how to protect their kids against this, like in schools. I mean, when you mentioned the school teacher, I mean, I'm like, I mean, I'm, you know, the kind of counseling I'm giving to parents now is just like pull them out of the indoctrination camps as quickly as possible by all means necessary. Like this is, this is, this is an acute crisis. We're in many acute crises uh, at the moment, at least here, here in North America. But when I hear, oh my God, when you, when you share that example of the, the male school teacher, you know, priming, priming the, 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 the kids for his uh, sexual fantasies or using their likeness for his own sexual fantasies and, and rape fantasies, I'm just like, wow, I'm like literally never never letting my kids my future kids out of my sight now <laughs> even if I was if I wasn't convinced before now that uh yeah I mean that's really really it's a scary time for parents it's a really really scary time I mean the, there's the there's the aspect of the media like that they're exposed to at school they're exposed like you know just their sh- their friends showing each other stuff on their phones uh, getting requested nudes, you know, kind of really ultimately strangers spending many, many hours a day with their children. Um, it's a really, it's a really tricky time to be a parent, like in, in kind of modern parenthood in this, uh, in this economy and uh, really difficult time. Well, just a thought I did have as, as you were talking about parents and, and their struggles, you know, particularly in this day and age and this culture and with media and technology and all the challenges presented by those things is, I guess, connected to what I just said about the child sex abuse dolls being modelled on children based on photos. Um, just that parents, it's it's really important to be mindful of what is what you're posting on social media, particularly to public platforms, because, you know, at Collective Shower, our work there, we're seeing a whole lot of exploitation of children uh, on public social media platforms like Instagram and, and things like that. And we're seeing images that maybe don't meet the level of child sexual abuse material, but still sexualized images of children or even mm-hmm. images of children that your average person wouldn't view as sexualized, but, you know, pedophiles would. We're seeing images, some innocent, some not really innocent, Uh, we're seeing these images taken from Instagram and distributed on pedophile forums. So pedophiles are literally just going to Instagram and taking images of children and sharing them with their networks. So I think parents need to just be really mindful of of their children's online safety and their digital footprint Mm. and where these anything, you know, you post something to the internet, it's out there and it's, it's out of your control. So, I mean, that's something kids need to understand, first of all, when they start to have access to phones and social media and everything. But parents as well, because a lot of the time it is parents just thinking they can post images 
you know, to their public Instagram or Facebook or wherever it is, and these images will be misused mm-hmm. and they'll be shared by by these kind of people. And now we're in this position where, you know, images can be made, you know, the likeness of a child can be used and made into a child sex abuse doll. And there was actually another woman in the book um, who, who I referenced and her story was shared by the Child Rescue Coalition and she found, well, a friend of hers sent her a message and um, a photo of a sex doll sold on, on Amazon. And she said that it bore a really striking resemblance to her eight-year-old daughter. And she said that one image actually appeared to recreate a photo of her daughter that she had shared on Facebook. And you can see the images sort of side by side. And it's like, yeah, well, there's so many similarities. It's the doll is wearing the same outfit, the hair, both got the side ponytail and the same hair tie and holding a soft toy and <gasps> the same striped socks. So, I mean, it does strongly suggest that this is a doll that's been modelled on a child based on a photo shared to a public platform. So, I mean, this this is not to say that, yeah. you know, if this happens, if something like this happens or your family or your child is victimised, that that's your fault. No, I mean, it's, you know, the fault of the perpetrators, but parents need to understand that these things are happening and that this is being done and they just need to need to be mindful of that and take appropriate um, precautions Oh, okay. Won't be posting my kids' photos on the internet. If I was <laughs> suspicious before, I'm more, uh, will be even more suspicious and cautious <laughs> moving forward. I mean, yeah, I've heard, uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of, uh, women with big followings, um, who've had their, their breastfeeding photos, uh, up on porn sites, breastfeeding videos on porn sites, um, like educational material, you know, trying to normalize breastfeeding. And yeah, I mean, we have to weigh like, the the dominant uh culture over your you know particular intention this this imagery it is a such a violation yeah. oh it's such a violation it's such a violation and it's like it's an injustice like it's frustrating to be like wow i have this beautiful photo shoot i'm so proud of the way my body looks i'm so proud of the number of years that i breastfed my my baby and i i really want to show that to the world and to show women that like what is possible and that you you can be in a space of love and appreciation at all phases of your you know reproductive uh lifetime or you know what whatever the the, the mission is however h- however sincere the intention is we have to weigh like, like you said like this is the reality of the dominant culture this is the reality of the internet and so just knowing that that's a possibility uh and then yeah making it making a decision oh mm-hmm. creepy creepy it's creepy. so awful just how men will take the act of a mother feeding her child and make it into porn and i actually did touch on that in the book i talked about well what i did is i tried to situate sex dolls and robots model on the bodies of women and girls within a context of technology that's used against women, whether it's Mm. sort of deep fake technology or deep nudes or, you know, breastfeeding voyeurism, you know, people, men taking photos or filming women while they're breastfeeding Mm -hmm. or just the ways through revenge porn or different apps or spyware or, you know, spy cams, but ways that women are uh, turned into pornography, even without their participation or without their consent or even without their knowledge. And this is happening with sex dolls as well. We're seeing cases where women are finding out about sex dolls made in their likeness. So it's not just children, it's happening to women too. There was one case uh, of a woman who was an Israeli model, like an Instagram influencer, and someone messaged her on Instagram and said, this sex doll looks a lot like you. And she was kind of like, yeah, whatever, and didn't really pay any attention to it because why would she? And then someone came back to her again and said, this sex doll has apparently been modelled after you. and the that he sent pictures as well and it was the manufacturer said oh yes I've given the doll this name which was her name and said oh you can see the woman this was inspired by and sent put a link to her Instagram page so and he's now selling you know this doll modeled on her and there was another case where a woman who um, was a singer well she's still a singer I'm sure uh, got a message from a man who said oh here's you know I've made a sex doll of you and sent photos and how just the violation that comes with that, that knowing that you did not consent to this, you did not want this, you did not ask for any of this, you're just living your life and some strange man out there has decided that he's going to make you into his own 3D pornography. 
so he can use your likeness and do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and use you in a sense for his own sexual pleasure. And you didn't ask to be involved, but that men have found this new way to violate women. And there are some manufacturers that will do this. They'll say, okay, we can't give you an 100% exact replica because we you know, might get in trouble, but we'll make it like 99% the same. We might change the eye color or something. So they, they find little ways to kind of get around things so they can still do it. But this means that women are still being victimized. And yet some manufacturers even report that they get requests for dolls made to look like you know, their next door neighbor or the person's friend's girlfriend or something. So they're still getting requests for dolls made in the likeness of actual women. And there's no indication that they're turning these requests down. So we have to wonder, like, how does this facilitate, like, this new form of violation of women? And, you know, what does this mean for women? How or all the ways that women can be harmed by this? Oh my gosh. Do you, for the Israeli uh model, do you know if she took legal action? Was she able to I'm not sure the status of where that's ended up. It from what I had read, it sounded like somehow there was a bit of a loophole where maybe she couldn't actually stop it, which I didn't understand. I couldn't fathom how you could not, you know, kind of pursue something there. So I'm not sure what the latest is. Hopefully there has been some sort of progress there. Oh, very uplifting. Yeah. Oh no, I, gosh. It's, well, now it's not I'm, I'm, easy. No, it, yeah. Yeah. Ne- neither is my pot. Yeah. <laughs> You've come to the right place to talk about not easy, not so easy topics. Uh, but I, yeah, I don't know if you have the wax museum in Australia. Do you have that? Mm-hmm. So like in the U S we have, um, it, uh, Madame Toussaint's Wax Museum and it's uh, yeah just like uh, celebrities replicated and uh, very like 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 their likeness is uncanny yeah modeled uh, it, like sculptures of you know in, in silicone um, and all sorts of materials real hair modeled after these celebrities and it's considered you know to have a statue made of you used to be considered you know like you've made it like you're famous you're worthy of of uh, people coming even to see like a fake version of you like people will pay mm-hmm. money to go to a museum to see a fake version of you like that's such a weird concept and like if you think of like greco-roman sculpture like yeah like a uh, you know it, it's taking something that used to be like a, a kind of a status like uh would be something uh someone of honor would have done of them but totally twisted and exploited and just like disgusting it's like it's just the most like twisted version of, of something that that could or used to be like a symbol of, of status or honor, like to have your likeness recreated outside of you, whether that's in a painting or in a sculpture uh, or in a plaque or, you know, what, whatever it, it might be. So that, that, that just came to mind. Mm, that's a really interesting concept. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, um, Caitlin. And, and where can people listening find your work? Where can they buy your book and support your work? Sure. Well, I mean, you can support my work. You can support the work of Collective Shout. We're we're at collectiveshout.org. We are on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. I'm on Twitter at Caitlin underscore Roper, uh, on Instagram at It's Caitlin Roper. And if they want to get a copy of the book, they can do that through Spinifex Press, the publisher. And if you go to the Spinifex Press website, there'll be information on how to access it from different countries, uh, different suppliers you can go through, or it's available on, you know, lots of different kind of online spaces. Okay, I will link all of that in, in the episode show notes. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for all the work that you're doing. Really appreciate you. And and thank you so much for yeah taking the time to, to talk about this today. Yeah, thanks so much, Isabel. It was really nice to meet you. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or family member who needs to hear this content. And if you do share it on social media, don't forget to follow and tag me at Whose Body Is It? So until next time, 